Good morning, everybody. We're back here in the biome at the Exploration Place for another episode of Headkeeper Sabrina and her team. Now, we just got to track them down today here. Let's see. Ah, there we go. Hey, Sabrina. Hey, Chad's here too. Awesome. Hey. What are you guys up to today? Well, we're, we're just talking about uh, how funny it is that uh, people will look at those crazy exotic animals like crocodiles and alligators and go, wow, it's like a living dinosaur. But they never take a look around and, and say, wow, isn't that an amazing flock of dinosaurs I just fly? <laughs> Amazing song dinosaur. Amazing song morning. Morning. You know it's spring when you hear the song dinosaur. It's in the true. Morning. It's true. For all sure. right, all right, you two. We're talking about birds, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> most certainly. Uh, what most people re don't realize is that birds are dinosaurs. So, not all dinosaurs were birds, but all birds are dinosaurs. And we've definitely got one here. This is Loki, right? Loki is my favorite dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us about him, Sabrina. What is Loki? So Loki is a black-billed magpie. Uh, he is in the crow family, or the, the Corvid family, not COVID family. <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to social distance from Loki. He's, <laughs> he's good. He's not going to pass anything on. Um, <laughs> so he is a very, very smart bird. Um, black-billed magpies are, like other Corvids, uh, definitely in the rankings of the smartest birds that exist. A lot of people think that parrots are the smartest birds. They do have the biggest brains, but these guys definitely have a higher cognitive function. The part of their brain that controls cognitive thought process, problem solving abilities, all of that sort of thing, um, is actually comparable uh, to great apes. Um, really? To, to chimps. Um, other than uh, mammals, they're the only uh, animal that's capable of tool use that they have learned on their own. So that's really interesting. Wild uh, New Caledonian crows, for example, they use lots of different tools on their own without anybody showing them. And in captivity, magpies can do lots of different neat things um, using tools that other animals would never be able to learn. So that's very interesting. So you're telling me when I'm here late at night and he spooks me, he's probably doing it on purpose. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, it, one of the really interesting things about corvids is that they are one of the only non-mammals that is aware of not only themselves as an individual, but they are aware that other individuals have their own thought process and their own feelings and ideas, which is a very complex um, thought pattern that most animals are not able to cognitively uh, comprehend. These guys are much smarter than they look. <laughs> now, I've heard a million stories about corvids and talking birds and one of them is people tell me that you have to cut their tongue to make them talk. That is most definitely not true. Do not ever cut a bird's tongue please. Uh, if anything it would make them less able to be able to perform speech. <laughs> These guys can talk uh, as long as they live near people. Even wild uh, corvids will talk. Obviously parrots and things like that do. But a lot of people don't realize that crows, magpies, ravens, these guys can talk as well. They're capable of mimicry and a lot of complex speech. So Loki, when he speaks, he would speak in English. Um, I've seen videos of birds all over the world copying different types of speech. So that part of their brain that I was talking about before that controls cognitive function is actually the same part of your brain that controls language. And because theirs is so complex, they're actually able to learn more uh, variety of different uh, dialects and things like that than any other type of animal. So they can understand what you're saying, but they also understand how to make up their own sort of phrases and words and stuff like that. So that's really cool. You'll often hear Loki saying things like, come over here. Um, or he will say, what? Uh, he barks like a dog. He laughs like a kid. He does an impression of John, <laughs> uh, who is one of our staff members here. Uh, and he's actually the one who raised Loki. He does an impression of him where he speaks in a low tone voice, uh, like a deep man's voice, which isn't his usual sort of sound. Uh, and he'll say things like, hey, come here, buddy. Hey, come here, buddy. And <laughs> the first time he did it, it sounded like he was speaking in tongues, and it really freaked me out. But yeah, he's extremely smart. And a lot of people just think of these guys as pests, which is a shame. The reason that they cause so much trouble is because they are so smart. So for example, crows will memorize um, the garbage route so that they know when the garbage man is coming. And they will even remember which garbage um, which garbage men are nice enough to like lift up the cans for them, or which ones will shoo them away, which ones are nice and not nice. These guys are capable of remembering faces for at least two years, but uh, recent scientific evidence actually suggests that these guys can pass information on 
from one generation to the next. So not only will a bird remember somebody, but it will actually tell other birds about that person, and those birds will tell other birds, and they will even tell their children about these about people. So if there's somebody um, that has done something bad or something good to them, other birds will know about that for generations. It's like an oral tradition. It's coming straight out of our indigenous yeah, forebears. Yeah, it is, and that's definitely how they have become so proficient um, and why they are considered such a pest these days is because they know all about us. Um, so they, they know how to get what they want when they want it, and a lot of the time that's very inconvenient to humans. So, so how did we wind up with Loki? Um, Loki is here because when he was just a little baby, him and his siblings got either knocked out of their nests or were pushed out of their nests too early. It's hard to say exactly what happened there, but they were attacked by a dog, and unfortunately his siblings did not survive. Loki was hiding. Um, I think in between the dog's house and a fence, and because of that, they were uh, actually it was our uh, our bosses who found this guy, the CEO. And um, so yeah, when when they found him, he was just a tiny little guy, and his siblings did not survive. So usually in that kind of situation, you're not able to return the baby to the parents because they often will not come back, especially if some of the babies have been killed. They just associate that that area with a very bad thing that had happened. And because these guys have such a complex social hierarchy in the wild, he would not be able to survive on his own. And if he was to be tried to introduce him into another group of existing wild magpies, he would likely be shunned by them and not taken in. I can't get over how well he's behaving right now. He's, he's just really sitting boy. there letting me take his picture. Yeah. Another thing a lot of people, uh, a huge misconception about magpies specifically, so this is something that doesn't usually apply to crows. Crows and ravens are often just hated for different reasons um, because of their behaviors. Magpies are also, I think, people have a little bit of extra resentment towards them. A lot of people think that they uh, are an invasive or an introduced species. That's been thought by the general public for a very long time. These guys are actually, um, they're definitely native to Canada. We used to think that they were the same as the Eurasian magpie, but they're two separate species. Uh, the ancestral magpie has been in North America for at least three to four million years. So. They're definitely not a new bird by any means, uh, and they are definitely not invasive. So this is, this is their home, and this is where they belong. <laughs> I have a question for you from Omi. Omi wants to ask, what does Loki like to eat, and where does he get his food? Hi, Omi. Good questions. So Loki likes to eat pretty much everything. In the wild, uh, corvids, so magpies, crows, and things like that, uh, they'll often feast on animals that have already died. They'll clean up the remains of things that wolves and other animals have killed. And they also forage for other things. So he eats fruit, he eats vegetables, he eats grains, and he definitely loves meat. Here he gets all of the above as well as lots of other treats. There's lots of people food he likes. He likes to have pasta, he likes hard boiled eggs, he likes uh, almost everything. But one of his favorite things is anything that is spicy. He really likes peppers, like um, bell peppers, habanero peppers he actually likes, which is surprising. Um, anything that has a very strong taste. A lot of birds don't taste things, uh, but Corvids actually have complex taste buds, so he definitely has a preference for what he's eating, and he likes a very wide variety of food. Yeah, I know he likes he ice gets cream. It from us. Yeah, he does. <laughs> In we the feed wild, him. He would get it from lots of different sources. They are um, opportunistic, which means that they just look for anything that they can eat and they eat it. So they'll follow. Uh, they'll actually follow herds of bison and things like that in the wild any large animals so that when those animals do get taken down by predators, they can swoop in and finish off the remains and kind of pick off the carcasses. I think for Loki, this self-isolation is becoming more difficult than it is for any of our other animals. He misses our visitors. He does, he does. He definitely um, is used to having kids come in. He's used to having people come in to talk to him and he likes to be the star of the show. Often if we're doing animal visits here in the biome with other animals, we'll have them out and we'll be doing a presentation. He gets very jealous sometimes, especially if we have a large group of people who are facing away from him and looking at another animal. Sometimes I think it's because he would consider the other animal a snack, like some of our amphibians and our insects and things like that. Um, but sometimes it's simply just because he wants to be the star of the show and the center of attention. So sometimes he will squawk and scream, or he will start to use his famous catchphrase, come over here, which is definitely uh, f pretty famous among guests here. They all, almost everyone has heard Loki say that at least once or twice. <laughs> So we've been letting him out a lot. Yes, um, right now he's in his cage and I think he's kind of confused. He seems to be letting him out first thing in the morning. Even when we're open to the public, I do let him out first thing in the morning. Today I kept him in his cage because lately he has been very defiant and he has just wanted to fly over the entire building, which is great for him. He gets his exercise when there's nobody here because he's not afraid to come out. 
Um, when there's guests here, he's definitely a lot more likely to stay near his cage just because he's not sure um, with strangers. He, he wants to be a little bit more cautious. He does like to interact with the guests and take treats from kids' hands and things like that. But when there are uh, a lot of people here, he'll often stay very close to me and he'll listen to me a lot better because he knows that I'm here to protect him. But when it's just us here, he just gets kind of bold and arrogant and wants to fly around and just do as he pleases. He just gave us a great shot of the beautiful iridescent green and blue that are in his feathers. There it is again. He's, yeah, he's such a beautiful bird. A lot of people think that magpies are just black and white and they're not. They have the, um, that beautiful iridescent chrome color to their, to their tails. They have sort of an opaque green and blue color to their wings and tail. And they also have purple and yellow in the certain, certain lights. If he's moving around, you can see them. Yeah, he's a beautiful bird. He is, yeah. And actually crows um, have some iridescent feathers too that you usually can't see. Most people think crows are just black, but most crows uh, in North America have purple, green, blue, and brown feathers that you just don't notice unless you're looking at them very close and on the right angle. Now, I see you've got some skeletons here with you. I do, I I'm do. I'm betting have... that's the dinosaur part of where we're headed, right? Yeah, so we were going to kind of tell you guys a little bit about um, the, the transition from dinosaur to bird. So birds have been birds for a very, very long time. We know that. Um, but they did come from dinosaurs. And they came from a, a distinct group of dinosaurs, which Chad, I think, wanted to tell you guys a little bit about. So we brought out some skeletons as a visual sort of representation of what we were going to explain. So maybe we should take these. If you want to let Loki out, maybe he'll join us, maybe he won't. Yeah, Loki, but, uh, to come out? I know he's definitely... We can head over to the Paleo Gallery. Thanks, Chad. And if we, come on. Come here. If we bring those uh, skeletons I'm with us... I'm going to the pigeon one because it's more... 3D. Sure, that yeah. sounds good. I will follow you guys. Head on out. Good work on the social distancing too, you guys. There's only five of us in here and 23,000 square feet, but you, amazing how often we're in the same room. <laughs> All right, so we're heading over here into the paleo gallery. And we have a paleo gallery because of our former museum manager of uh, curatorial, Bob Campbell. He spent, I don't know how many, 18 years or something at the Royal Terrell Museum. And funnily enough, we have wound up with dinosaurs in our center. So this is Chad at the foot of a Struthiomimus. Yes, Struthiomimus. And just to, to start off, I would like to uh, express very carefully that I am not a paleontologist. I am an interested amateur. Uh, so if there's any of the, uh, the real pros out there, the Richard McCrays, the Phil Currys, the Lisa Buckleys of, of the province, or the Bob Campbells, um, please, please feel free to correct me, but please be very gentle. <laughs> yeah, be nice to Chad. We need him to keep doing these things. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, anyways, yeah, the Struthiomimus. Um, it's uh, translated to ostrich mimic. And uh, so it's a part of uh, the group of dinosaurs that birds belong to, uh, theropods. Now theropods is a very large group, which includes things like Albertosaurus and T-Rex, and those aren't avian dinosaurs. Those, those are just part of the same group, but they show a lot of very similar um, traits to birds, and they're, they're, they're a great clue as to the origin of birds. So if you look at this bird, it has three digits facing forward and one facing backwards. It's a reduced digit facing back. This one, it's not quite as reduced because it's been adapted for perching a lot. And if you look at the Struthiomimus here, it also has these three digits and it would have had a slightly reduced digit on the back as well. Now that is um, not an adaptation for perching, but for running quite fast. Um, so that's that three-toed print that we have quite three often. Three-toed print, and you'll always notice that they're kind of sharp prints because the, these are both, as with birds, uh, digigrade as opposed to plantigrade, what we are. What? You have to tell me that again. So, what is digigrade or plantigrade? Plant, uh, plantigrade, what we are, we wait there on our heel, on, on, the, on our foot. Whereas uh. they're bearing their weight when they're moving 
on their digits. So when my yoga instructor is telling me to make sure the weight is in all three corners of my foot, that's plantigrade. That's plantigrade, exactly. Gotcha. Also, you'll notice the, where the, the limbs come off of the hips is very characteristic in theropods, um, and uh, including birds, they come straight down as opposed to uh, lizards, which lay their, their limbs out. Oh yeah, they're just attached in the one spot and go forward from there. Exactly, exactly. Another common characteristic is the S-curved neck. Ah, well there's definitely a curved, curved neck. neck here. And they, instead of bearing the weight of their body in their hips as we do, we find our center of balance in our hips. They're leaning forward and they're weight bearing on their backbone. And that's why they have this S-curved neck. Oh, to, to make it stronger. Exactly. Now, this guy is not a bird. He has a common ancestor to birds. And so, in evolution, we like to look for these missing links, right? And the missing link that we have here, unfortunately we don't have any fossils of it in our gallery, but very few places do, uh, is Archaeopteryx which means old wing. So this was the transition from these guys, not that particular species of dinosaur, but within that group, to modern birds. Now you'll see, here's a photo of the fossil that's in situ. It's just in the place where it was found. And you'll see it has um, a lot of- Too much very, glare. Sorry. Okay, go ahead and point. So it has a lot of, of um, both uh, lizard-like and or, or reptilian and avian features. It has a bony tail. Modern birds don't have a bony tail. These guys did have a bony tail. Ah, uh, yes. This guy actually also had teeth. Now, interestingly enough, you'll notice that the Struthiomimus did not have teeth, and that's something that we call convergent evolution. It's not, um, it's not an evolutionary characteristic that is through descent. It's through being in a similar habitat. So it evolved for similar situations, such as nut eating. But interestingly enough, early birds um, have been shown to have both had teeth and not had teeth. So Sabrina, um, are there any birds today that have teeth? Like how would they get into nuts and things? So birds will use, uh, well obviously different birds use different adaptations. I talked about the New Caledonia crows and how those guys will use tools. So one of the things that those guys will do is actually leave nuts on the street. For example, they know where cars will pass by. So they'll go to the intersections and they'll wait for a red light and they will put their, their nuts down where the cars are about to drive over and let them fly over. Some birds do. Some birds do have a ridge uh, in their jaws, a rated jaw that's sort of like teeth. Swans have that, loons have that. There's a couple of different predatory species um, of waterfowl that have that. Most birds would just grab their prey and swallow it whole or tear it apart depending on the, the species. Like eagles, for example, will grab things with their talons, pull them up and use their beaks to rip them apart. Um, but things like loons and swans, they eat fish and stuff, but they just swallow them whole. So it definitely depends, again, on, uh, as Chad was saying, on their environment. So. If a bird lives uh, in the water and it's eating in the water, it's probably gonna eat things that it can just pick up and swallow whole because it doesn't really have anywhere to put that prey item while it's eating, as well as it, its feet aren't equipped for that. Its feet aren't made for grabbing or perching or anything like that, its feet are made for swimming. Uh, loons actually can't even walk on land. A lot of people don't know that. They are completely aquatic. So when a bird, when a loon is landing in the water, if it misses um, the body of water bite, even 10, 12 feet, sometimes they don't make it to the water and they will die. So that's, that's definitely a thing about convergent evolution and about how different animals fill different niches in um, their ecosystems is just based on their distinct anatomy is meant to match the place where they're living. So their body parts and the things that they do and the way that they use their bodies is all um, dependent on where they live. So evolution is really why we have the creatures that we have today and, and the situations that they're in. 100%. Now, I have another question here from Omi who wants to know what these dinosaurs would have eaten. And I'm assuming he's ask, asking about um, the Struthiomimus and our Albertosaurus. The Struthiomimus now very much uh, is thought to be omnivorous. 
So he would have eaten small animals, insects, lots of seeds, right? Yeah. yeah. So well, omnivorous well, means they eat plants and meat, right? Exactly. Gotcha. These sharp fangs here. <laughs> I would venture a guess that he's uh, very much carnivorous, just relying on, on uh, meat, such as the Struthiomimus lunch right here. I see. All right. There you go, Omi. All Another right. Another interesting thing about all of the theropods that connects them to birds is um, the fact that they're one of the only other groups of animals that has a perculum or a wishbone. Oh. Now, we're not quite sure why. There's a lot of ideas circulating about why they would have a, a curriculum. In birds, it's very much um, part of that strength for flight. But these guys couldn't fly, obviously, right? Um, but, uh, but, I mean, just imagine pulling apart a, a T-Rex wishbone, you know, <laughs> over turkey dinner, right? <laughs> Now, one more question from me is, what are we likely to see around here? Like, if you were going looking for evidence of fossils or dinosaurs, what would you uh, find in our region? Because I've been told we don't really have much in the way of bones in this part of the world. Bones, bones are hard to find no matter where you go. So we get a lot of trackways if you come over here. And um, trackways now, again, not being a paleontologist, I would have probably walked right by this. But these are Cretaceous shorebirds. So just like you would see uh, birds on the shore down on any coast. Oh, when you, you use that flashlight, trackways. it pops them right out. Right out. So, and trackways are, are really good indicators of a lot of things. They can tell us a lot about the size of the animal. They can tell it about the behavior, it's social habits, right? Um, I mean, right here you see a lot of these shore birds, or shore dinosaurs for that matter, and how they congregate, how they move along. Um, they can tell us how fast, if we have a series of them, how fast it moves, how what its stride is. So trackways are a fantastic tool. Um, so when people are out on their walks and along shores and on banks, this is the kind of thing they might come across. And oh, if they yes. do, they should take a picture. They should take a picture. And then get in touch with one of the paleontology groups. Or yes, they could they let should. us know and or we would connect. Exactly. And that's, that's a very important thing. Right? I have another question here. What kind of plant does Duplosaurus and Bronchosaurus? So maybe, I'm not sure what either of those ones are. But it wants to know what they eat but they wow. sound like plant eaters to me. They sound like plant eaters to me too. I mean, I, I, I would suspect they would eat a lot of what was around at the time and um, you would find um, some similar plants uh, today are cycads, um, are willows, are alders, um, are, are oaks, things like that. Ferns have been around forever Ferns too. Ferns have been around forever too. Awesome. Well, this is great. I guess Loki decided he didn't want to join us in the galleries this no. morning, but... Uh, He's intimidated by the larger dinosaurs. <laughs> it's just a small dinosaur. It's good. If he gets up on the neck of one of these, I don't know how we're convincing him to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much again for both of you today. We got two for one today. Yeah, this is great. First, our, our first collaboration. Yeah. I like it, and we're planning to do more of these. So if you have any more questions, please post them in the comments below, and Chad or Sabrina will get back to you on them. And in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your Friday. It is Friday today, for those of you that don't know what day it is, like the rest of us. Uh, but yeah, enjoy your weekend, and uh, we will be back on Monday. And I believe that Chad is going to take us down into our collections vault again on Monday, are you not? Yes, so we're going to go look at some historical photos. Awesome. That's great. Well, thanks, everyone, and uh, thanks again to Hell Yeah Prince George for letting us be here on their page. Bye for now. See you guys.